Welcome back, one and all, to another installment of Space This Week, the weekly recap of rockets, RUDs, and R&D relating to spaceflight. And what a week it's been! I'm going to keep this intro nice and short since we saw so many launches last week and have lots of reasons to be excited for the next seven days as well. There are also some interesting historic spaceflight anniversaries set to take place over the course of this week too, which we'll be delving into in detail as well. Before kicking off our first segment, make sure you've hit subscribe and rung the little bell down below so that you receive a notification of these videos as soon as they're live in order to ensure that the news you're about to receive is delivered on time and is as up to date as possible as opposed to like three weeks out. Anyway, with that out of the way, let us commence the first segment of our coverage, all the launches that we saw happen last week. Our first flight last week was on Sunday the 17th of January and was the first ever successful orbital flight of Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 vehicle. I know this technically happened the week before last, but because the launch time was so close to the upload time of last week's episode, I couldn't really cover it properly last week. So let's do it this week instead. And hey, some people consider the first day of the week to be a Sunday, so in a way, none of that clarification was really needed. <laughs> the Launcher 1 took flight under the wing of Virgin Orbit its modified 747, nicknamed Cosmic Girl, carrying nine American small satellites bound for low Earth orbit. Most of them were technology demonstration satellites, but among them was a microgravity research satellite from the University of Central Florida and an atmospheric research satellite from California Polytechnic State University. The flight was a resounding success, and I look forward to watching many more launches from the Launcher 1. I'm especially excited about this particular rocket as there's talks of it launching from Newquay Airport, which is only about an hour's drive from my house, so maybe one day we'll be able to do some on-site launch coverage on this show. One day. <laughs> the next launch of the week was on the 19th of January and was a Chinese Long March 3BE rocket that launched from the Zichang Launch Complex and on board was the Tiantong 103 communication satellite on behalf of the China Satellite Communications Company. The launch was a success and and the satellite is now happily orbiting in a geosynchronous Earth orbit. The next day, on the 20th of January, Rocket Lab launched their workhorse Electron rocket on its 18th mission, dubbed Another One Leaves the Crust. The Electron launched from the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, and on board was a single communication microsatellite for the European space technology company OHB Group, which was successfully deployed just over one hour after liftoff. The Electron first stage was expended once again for this mission, but long term, Rocket Lab plan on recovering the first stage for reuse in a similar fashion to SpaceX's Falcon 9. However, Rocket Lab have stated that the Electron cannot carry enough fuel to have the required amount left over for a powered landing, so instead the company plans for the booster to deploy a parachute and then have a helicopter catch it in mid-air. Rocket Lab have already demonstrated their ability to catch a booster in such a manner, and during their mission, Return to Sender, they demonstrated their ability to recover a first stage from a real flight. We're still early days into Rocket Lab's reusability ventures, but the future is certainly looking exciting for the Electron. After Electron, also on the 20th of January, SpaceX launched their latest batch of Starlink satellites aboard their trusty Falcon 9 rocket. The flight plan of the launch was nothing too different from the usual Starlink formula. The Falcon 9 took off from the Kennedy Space Center, and after second stage separation, the Falcon 9 aimed toward the drone ship just read the instructions, 633 kilometers downrange. The 60 Starlink satellites deployed not long after this. SpaceX attempted to recover the fairings for the mission, both of which were reflown from previous missions, but unfortunately both halves were destroyed and not recovered due to rough seas. While at face value this mission seems fairly ordinary for SpaceX, the company did break a few records on this flight. Records that took serious engineering ingenuity and a keen understanding of science and maths, subjects that are typically quite difficult to grasp, but can be made easy thanks to this video's sponsor, Brilliant! Brilliant is a fantastic problem-solving online resource that has over 60 interactive learning courses in science, maths, and computer science. What I love about Brilliant is that they have a real knack in taking complex and intimidating topics and breaking them down into easily understood chunks. I'm guessing that if you're watching this video, then you probably find rocket launches interesting. Maybe you'd like to learn more about the physics behind these amazing vehicles, in which case Brilliant has an excellent course in classical mechanics, which provides a great hands-on learning experience on a wide range of concepts that rocket scientists work with every day. 
including angular kinematics, the rocket equation, and Einstein's theory of relativity, and every step of the way the content is presented in a fun and engaging way. If all this sounds good to you, then click on my link, brilliant.org slash Lown, as using my link will not only let Brilliant know that you came from here, but also gets the first 200 people to use it 20% off their annual premium subscription. Brilliant elevates maths and science from something to be feared to a delightful experience of guided discovery, so don't forget to click that link. Anyway, massive thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. As I was saying, the Falcon 9 flight here was fairly standard, but this flight was the fastest turnaround of a booster ever, being just 38 days after its previous flight. And to make things even more impressive, this was the first time a Falcon 9 first stage has successfully flown and subsequently landed eight times. Here's hoping this booster will clock in many more in the future. The final launch of the week was another SpaceX Falcon 9 launch. Unlike the previous pretty standard going Starlink mission before it, this one was rather special. That's because this was SpaceX's first dedicated rideshare mission, as in every satellite inside the fairing is a small sat payload. Given that the Falcon 9 is a pretty powerful launch vehicle, SpaceX were able to cram a whopping 133 commercial and government satellites, which included CubeSat, Microsat, and orbital transfer vehicles, as well as 10 Starlink satellites that would become the first in the Starlink constellation to deploy to a polar Earth orbit. The 10 Starlink satellites brought the total number of satellites launched to a whopping 143, netting SpaceX the record of most number of satellites deployed in a single launch, smashing the previous record of 108 satellites launched by an Antares rocket in 2018. The icing on the cake was the fifth successful touchdown of this Falcon 9 first stage on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, and the stream held up better than usual, giving us an almost completely uninterrupted view of the touchdown. Excellent stuff. The record set by this mission might not stand for too long though, as SpaceX plan on doing more dedicated smallsat rideshare missions in the future on both Falcon 9 and eventually on Starship as well. And speaking of Starship, let's check in on how SpaceX are getting on at their Texan rocket farm in Boca Chica. I'm beginning the Starship coverage this week once again with the latest infographic from the awesome Brendan Lewis. And I know what you're thinking, this is getting out of hand, now there are two of them. That's right, the forward dome of Super Heavy Booster number 2 has been spotted on site. We also have confirmation that a new Starship prototype is in the works too. The thrust puck of the SN18 was spotted at the rocket farm, which is very exciting news to hear as well. We discussed the little SN7.2 last week, but to briefly recap, this is not a full-scale Starship, obviously, but rather is a test tank made of steel that's only 3mm thick, rather than 4mm thick. It was rolled out to its testing platform this week, where we will assume it will be tested to destruction, much like its predecessors the SN7 and SN7.1. If the thinner tank material proves worthy, then its application to a full-scale Starship would result in a massive mass saving, meaning that there's much more room in the crew quarters for dope Mad Clown merch. Shameless yet seamless plug which you can buy for yourself in the description, boom! Marketing. <laughs> Going back to Brendan's diagram though, it also looks like SN10 is completely finished, which means we won't have to wait too long to watch another Starship fly once the SN9 is done with testing. And speaking of the SN9, on Friday we were treated to a successful static fire, which one would hope means that the rocket has now fulfilled all of its required testing before it can make a high altitude flight, meaning we may well get to see this beast fly in a mere matter of days. Elon Musk confirmed on Twitter that SpaceX hoped to launch the SN9 at some point this week, which is incredible really. It's barely been a month since SN8's flight, and we're already counting down the days to the SN9. Hopefully the flight goes as smoothly as predicted in this fantastic render by Corey. Check out the full video from the link in the description. However, I think that the biggest Starship news this week didn't even come from Boca Chica. This week, we learned that SpaceX have acquired two former oil rigs, which they plan on converting into sea launch platforms. They've been dubbed Phobos and Deimos, named after the two moons of Mars, presumably due to SpaceX's goal of sending a fleet of starships to colonize the red planet. SpaceX 
Trek's concept animations have always shown their intention of launching Starship from the water, but it's nevertheless very cool to see progress materialising before us. Moving on from Starship developments, we learned some more news about the aborted SLS Green Run Hot Fire test that happened on January the 16th. The Hot Fire test was supposed to last for 8 minutes, but was cut off barely a minute in. All we knew at the time was that it was caused by a major component failure, so hopes were low about it being a minor issue. However, NASA have now confirmed that the shutdown was triggered by conservative parameters deliberately put in place for ground testing to protect the rocket during testing inside the giant testing stand. If the same scenario were to have occurred in flight, the rocket would have continued to fly. The team at NASA is optimistic that the SLS is still on track to launch Orion to the Moon on Artemis 1 reasonably soon, and I'm sure we'll hear more about the SLS as work continues. But that's it for all the news that happened last week, so now let's move along to our next segment, all the launches we've got to look forward to over the next seven days. But before we roll that transition, if you are enjoying this video, guys, then I do have to shamelessly ask you to leave a little like down below really helps the channel out. Anyway, let's roll that transition so we can move on to talking about all the launches we can expect to see over the next seven days. This week we'll begin with the launch of the next SpaceX Starlink mission. This will be on the 27th of January and since I've already talked about last week's Starlink mission in quite a lot of depth, I'll just keep my coverage on this one short. The Falcon 9 will launch from the Kennedy Space Center with 60 Starlink satellites on board. The first stage will attempt to land 633 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship and the fairing recovery ships Ms. Tree and Ms. Chief will be attempting to recover the fairings as well. Hopefully SpaceX will pull this one off as effortlessly as they always seem to do. Actually, in retrospect, I probably shouldn't have rushed the Starlink coverage too much as it's the only confirmed rocket launch this week. There are three Chinese rockets that are supposed to be launching in January and since this is the final week of January, one would assume they'd be launching in the coming days, though since nothing is confirmed, I wouldn't bet on them flying. Who knows, I'd love to be proven wrong and have lots to talk about in next week's episode, but for now, we'll just move along to the final segment of the video, all the most interesting historic anniversaries we have to look forward to over the next seven days. Our history segment starts on a solemn note. On the 27th of January in 1967, the tragic Apollo 1 fire claimed the lives of all three astronauts on board, Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chaffee. The Apollo 1 launch wasn't scheduled to launch until February and would have been the first orbital test of the Apollo Command and Service module. The disaster happened during a launch simulation test designed to determine whether the Apollo spacecraft would operate nominally on internal power while detached from all cables and umbilicals. The hatches of the command pod were closed and the spacecraft was pressurized with pure oxygen. During testing, a wiring fault created a spark, which then turned into a fire. A fire needs three things to burn, heat, fuel, and oxygen. The Apollo 1 spacecraft air was 100% oxygen, creating the perfect environment for the fire to grow very quickly and burn very, very hot. In a matter of seconds, it was out of control. Post-mortem of the astronauts' bodies revealed extensive burns, but the cause of death for all three men was found to be cardiac arrest due to high concentrations of carbon monoxide, meaning that they were almost certainly unconscious before the fire consumed them. So one very minor positive aspect of the disaster was that it's likely the astronauts didn't suffer. In the wake of the fire, the Soviet Union, America's competitor in the space race, expressed to the American government how sorry they were to hear the news, and the Apollo program itself was halted for almost two years. Even today, it's unclear exactly what started the fire. The remains of the capsule were scoured by engineers who found several possible origin points, but no definitive cause was found. In the aftermath, several modifications to the spacecraft were made, including a redesign of the hatch to allow faster exit or rescue, replacement of flammable materials, and reduction of the oxygen concentration in the capsule's air supply. While a very painful lesson to learn, there has thankfully never been another fire in an American spacecraft since. Unfortunately, the day after the 27th is another somber day. On the 28th of January 1986, Space Shuttle Mission STS-51L took flight, and 73 seconds after launch, the Space Shuttle Challenger disintegrated, killing all seven astronauts on board. 
The morning of the launch was unusually cold and engineers argued that the Challenger should not take off because the temperature was minus one degree Celsius. So cold that the O-rings, a rubber ring designed to seal the joints in the solid rocket motors, wouldn't work correctly. The O-rings could only seal correctly in temperatures above 12 degrees Celsius. NASA commanders argued that the O-rings would work, but of course they were later proved wrong. The temperature at launch was so low that icicles were seen hanging off some parts of the launch pad. Just over one minute after liftoff, the shuttle main engines increased their power to the highest thrust possible, and the flight controllers informed the shuttle crew that their flight status was go at the throttle up stage. Then, at 72 seconds after liftoff, the right solid rocket booster pulled away from part of the reinforcements that held it to the external fuel tank. In the same instant, Challenger veered off its intended path. Half a second later, pilot Michael J. Smith said the last words picked up by the shuttle's recorder. A simple phrase, uh-oh. In what may have been a response to the shuttle's computer warning that the engines were moving quickly to compensate for the loose booster in a futile attempt to regain control of the vehicle. Little is known of what happened in the minutes after breakup. The crew cabin was still intact as it started to fall, and the official report into the disaster stated that the crew survived the first breakup, with at least three people still alive at this stage. There is evidence that they moved switches that required a cover to be pulled off before they could be moved, in a probable attempt to regain control of the craft. The cabin didn't have any form of parachute or escape system, and it smashed into the ocean after falling for nearly three minutes. Any crew that might have survived up until this point would have died on impact instantly. The deceleration would have resulted in nearly 200 times the force of normal gravity, which would be like going from zero to four and a half thousand miles an hour, and then back to zero again, all within one second. Visitors to the Kennedy Space Center can view debris from Challenger's last mission, as well as debris from Space Shuttle Columbia, at an exhibit called Forever Remembered, which opened in 2015. Every January, NASA pauses to remember the final crews of shuttles Challenger and Columbia, the crew of Apollo 1, and other crews lost in pursuing space on a NASA Day of Remembrance. On the 31st of January in 1961, NASA launched Mercury Redstone 2, which was the penultimate test flight of the Mercury Redstone launch vehicle ahead of the first crewed mission in Project Mercury. On board the vessel, designated Mercury spacecraft number 5, was Ham the Chimp. The flight started off well, but then a few malfunctions occurred. Due to issues with the Redstone booster and the abort sensing system, the spacecraft ascended to an altitude of 157 miles instead of 115, resulting in a splashdown 422 miles downrange instead of 290. The overacceleration of the vehicle resulted in an acceleration force of 17G inflicted upon the spacecraft. Happily, the launch escape system worked correctly, and Ham amazingly survived the flight without any real injury. The brave chimp performed his side of the mission well, pushing levers about 50 times during the flight. After his historic flight, he was transferred to the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., where he lived for 17 years before being moved to a zoo in North Carolina to live with a colony of other chimps. Ham died on January the 19th, 1983, at the age of 26, and is now buried at the New Mexico Museum of Space History in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Our final anniversary is on the 31st of January and is the launch of Apollo 14. Astronauts Alan Shepard, Stuart Rusa, and Edgar Mitchell aboard their massive Saturn V rocket begun their epic mission to the Fra Mauro Highlands on the moon. They wouldn't land on the moon until February the 5th, which is very much next week's space history territory, so we'll talk about this mission a little bit more next Monday. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that one. But that's it for the most interesting historic anniversary set to take place this week. And that's it! Another episode of Space This Week is concluded! While there's not a lot of orbital launches happening this week, I'm sure we'll definitely be in for a treat on the high altitude front, with SpaceX hoping to launch their SN9 into the skies in the next few days. Plus, it's probably for the best that we get a little breather from last week's launch schedule. Many thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. I've been having lots of fun expanding my knowledge with their excellent teaching material, and the first 200 people to click the link in the description can enjoy 20% off while letting the good folks at Brilliant know that you came from here. 
Without wanting to drag this video out for too much longer, I think it's time we can swing across to the end screen. To the left is a link to the full Space This Week playlist. To the right is a video from my channel chosen for you based on your viewing habits by YouTube's recommendation algorithms. There's also a link to subscribe and check out my Patreon if you want to support the channel monetarily. And I already mentioned that you can buy my merch from the description as well as follow me on Twitter, check out my Discord, Instagram, that sort of stuff. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you have an excellent week.